Um, so I just want to start uh, by sharing what we'll cover today. Uh, we'll have a, a welcome um, from Mayor Dan Levine Cava and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we'll have a, a draft, uh, a, an overview of the 2024 draft report um, that you all are here to, to learn about. And, and, and then you'll learn how to submit uh, formal public comments uh, on that draft report, um, which is open uh, for as part of a 30 day public comment period. And then we will have a question and answer session um, at the end um, to stay on as long as uh, folks have questions to make sure everyone um, understands and, and gets anything clarified that they need to. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining. Um, a few quick ground rules uh, for this virtual public webinar. Um, please, we ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation um, and the question and answer uh, session unless you are sort of called on during the Q&A session. Um, please, please enter all your questions and comments into the chat box. We have uh, county staff who are monitoring and, and taking notes and we'll be uh, collecting those questions for the uh, session at the end of the presentation. Um, and if we don't get to your question during this meeting, um, we'll be sure to follow up um, as needed um, to make sure everyone has the information that they need. Um, so we're really excited to have you here. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Jim Murley, our, our senior resilience advisor, um, to introduce uh, the mayor. Jim. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to acknowledge also online, um, co-introducing co with me is the interim chief resilience officer, Dr. Patricia Gomez. Hello, Patricia. Uh, both of us are uh, honored to serve our, our county mayor, Danielle Levine Cava. She's been a strong supporter of the Office of Resilience since she was the city commissioner. And now our mayor, she's made our office uh, part of her uh, initiatives and importance. And uh, she working from the very top, from the, from the assistant secretary of the army, Michael Connor down with the Corps of Engineers leadership has uh, gotten us to where we are tonight. Welcome Mayor Cava, please. Uh, Give us your remarks. Very good. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Well, Jim, thanks for the introduction, but in actual fact, you are the one who has gotten us to this point. Uh, but I'm a tag along and, and maybe a quick learner. So, uh, and I certainly am thrilled that we were able to meet with Assistant Secretary Connor and, and move this new approach forward. And this is actually the culmination of that conversation, which was probably two and a half years ago, and something like that, something very impressive at the Everglades Coalition meeting uh, down in Key Largo. So uh, welcome back to everybody who has been taking part in this back base study, and thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. This is a multi-year process, and your continued engagement is critical. So it's not a one and done. It's something that really requires uh, vigilance because we're all working together to co-create something. Uh, and that's how we're collaborating with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that we have been so privileged to work with on many, many projects. We know we have more projects than any place in the country. So I like to say we know they really love us. Thank you so much. And particularly, I'd like to thank our U.S. Army Corps Norfolk District Colonel Brian Hallberg. He uh, is with the Jacksonville District and we want to, oh, excuse me, and the Jacksonville District and the entire Army Corps family for their continued support and expertise, because there are many and they are mighty. Uh, the goal of this study has been to come up with solutions that will protect us from storm surge, which is the rising water that comes after a storm. And we all saw what happened in Naples, um, excuse me, Fort Myers Beach after Hurricane Ian. That is exactly the kind of situation that we are preparing to protect ourselves from. <clears throat> we cannot stop the storms from happening, but we can significantly reduce the damage. We can save lives and we can leverage investments now that will protect future generations. This is just one of the many, many initiatives that Miami-Dade County has undertaken to build resilience, to mitigate flooding and sea level rise and to prioritize nature-based solutions. Last month, there was an update on the three main pillars of the draft comprehensive study framework, 
which are one, multiple lines of defense, two, nimble adaptive management through a phased approach, and three, integration of the many U.S. Army, Army Corps studies into local resilience efforts. And all of this lays the foundation for continued study and collaboration as we advance these initially proposed projects that are detailed in the draft report. Uh, so um, <clears throat> your voices are really, really critical to uh, steer us towards a new approach that will better protect and reflect the needs of our community. So with your support and Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, Michael Connor and his staff, we gave a resounding go last August to continue with the study. And that is the official language that is used. Now, as outlined in this draft report, we're committed to co-creating, testing, and deploying nature-based solutions that we know you want as part of a one-of-a-kind pilot program. And we are definitely at the cutting edge of these approaches. And this will include exploring coral reefs, the dune system, mangroves, and much more. The draft report also prioritizes protecting critical facilities like police and fire stations during and after a disaster. We're also focused on elevating homes and floodproofing homes and businesses, especially in those communities that would be most affected. Uh, we are no stranger to long-term large-scale projects that can reverse ecosystem damage. That's what we're already doing with our comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan or SERP. So it's not our first rodeo in partnership with the cities, the universities, all level of government, all levels, nonprofits, businesses, and residents, we will get this job done. So we know there's no time to waste. Let's get funding for the projects we all agree to in the, this year's WERDA or Water Resources Development Act so we can deliver results to our residents now. I wanna emphasize that. I think this is also an innovative and creative approach where we are not waiting for the final final to go for the whole funding stream. We are actually taking steps, interim steps throughout to move the projects forward. Uh, we're gonna build on each phase to make these protections stronger, more comprehensive and more connected. You're gonna hear more details obviously about this draft report this evening, and you're gonna learn about opportunities on how to submit formal comments to the Army Corps. Um, so your continued feedback is critical to build a future ready Miami-Dade together. So thank you for devoting yourself to this vital work, for coming tonight. And now it is my great honor to introduce Colonel Brian Halber. His unwavering support of this study has been critical to our success. And he is a scholar and a gentleman. Colonel, you are always welcome in Miami-Dade. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Mayor Kava. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Colonel Hallberg is unable to be with us this evening. He did make the trip to Miami last week, and he was in person with us uh, during the in-person public meeting. But in his absence, if I may, I'd like to share some of his opening remarks. Good evening and welcome to this pivotal moment in our journey towards enhancing the resiliency of Miami-Dade County. It's an honor to be with you today as we gather to discuss the vital Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Storm Mismanagement Feasibility Study Draft Integrated Feasibility Report and Environmental Assessment. As we convene tonight, we do so with a profound sense of purpose and shared responsibility. Our mission is clear to forge a path towards a more resilient future for Miami-Dade County one that safeguards our residents, businesses, and infrastructure from the increasing threats posed by coastal storms and rising sea levels. Throughout this process, the principles of partnership have guided our efforts. We've embraced the three C's of partnership, communication, commitment, and collaboration. Together with Miami-Dade County, we've engaged in open dialogue, demonstrating our unwavering commitment to listening to your concerns, insights, and suggestions. Tonight, we invite you to continue this important conversation, not only through email, but by sharing this important opportunity to voice your input with your neighbors, friends, and community members, because your voices matter. 
Your input will shape the final feasibility report, guiding our actions as we work to secure vital federal funding for projects aimed at boistering our coastal defenses and safeguarding our community for generations to come. Know that your participation during this comment period is essential in ensuring that our strategies are robust and effective. Together, we can harness the power of partnership to build a more resilient Miami-Dade County, one that thrives in the face of adversity and emerges stronger than ever before. Let's make tonight's meeting a testament to the strength of our community and our shared vision for a brighter, more resilient future. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Michelle. And um, just to make sure I give you the proper introduction, Michelle's been our uh, one of our leads at the Norfolk District and is the Chief of Planning and uh, the Policy Branch at the U.S. Army Corps for the Norfolk District. So, Michelle, thanks for, for sharing those words. Colonel Hallberg, um, always appreciate the, the support um, from, the, from the district and the entire team there. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, yeah, I'd turn it to you, Michelle, to help cover uh, the next couple slides about where we've been in the in the, the timeline. Thanks. Absolutely, Christian. Thank you so much. And as Mayor Kava mentioned, back in August 2023, we had the GO meeting where we were given the permission to move forward and do great things. And following that, certainly we had our public webinar. In December of that same year, we received guidance from headquarters that directed us to look towards what can we do in the interim of uh, what measures can we do more quickly to begin to address uh, coastal storm risks within Miami-Dade County. And so the team dug in and we uh, conducted a workshop and did, conducted several site visits and uh, formulated on uh, a number of alternatives that are evaluated in the draft report. And that report came out in, in April. On April 23rd, it was published. And we are now in that formal NEPA comment period. So absolutely, please uh, send us your comments as you review the draft report. All of this will culminate to a final report, which we will submit for uh, review. That will go for, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that will go for uh, policy and legal compliance review and uh, state and agency review, and that will end with a uh, signed chief's report in August of, the, of this year. And why that is important is that it will be included in, we expect that to be included in the Water Resources Development Act of 2024. And that is used to authorize studies and projects uh, to be uh, to move into that next phase towards design and construction. So right now, all of your comments, we will you know, please submit your comments for consideration and uh, based on the draft report we have uh, that's available for your review. Next slide, Kirsten. So the NEPA process is a very important process which requires federal agencies to evaluate alternatives, disclose their environmental effects for the proposed actions, and consider public input, and certainly encourages federal agencies to make more environmentally responsible decisions. Some of the resource areas that are considered in this report and are outlined in Chapter 7 include certainly aesthetics and visual resources, environmental justice and social economics, uh, air quality and um, wildlife resources and habitats. Other um, aspects that have been identified, these uh, resources that have been evaluated are evaluated for the plan, um, the tentatively selected plan that's been outlined within the report. In addition, we have also conducted a high level review of the programs that we are requesting for authorization that will look at an over uh, again, a high level review of those programs. And as we move those programs forward, as they are authorized and we are able to implement them, additional analysis will be conducted for those, for the individual uh, projects that result of those programs. As we looked at the resources um, for the, for the uh, tentatively selected plan, we concluded that there are no significant impacts expected as a result of this plan. Next slide. So the draft report has three major components. First is the comprehensive study framework. 
Next are, is the recommended measures outlined in our tentatively selected plan, and then the new programs that we are requesting for authorization. Next slide. The comprehensive framework is uh, comprised of three major pillars, and the expectation is that we have such a large area, a large complex area, that the uh, measures, that this really requires a long-term approach uh, to tackle the challenge of, sorry, to tackle the challenge of this, uh, the vulnerable areas within Miami-Dade County. The three pillars include the multiple lines of defense and the slides following this slide will go into more detail. And then uh, also includes adaptive management, not only looking at the short term, what can we implement now, but also those longer term opportunities. And then imp integration of programs, projects, and studies, all the great work that's going on within the uh, study area. Next slide, sorry. Thank you. So there is a lot of great work going on within this area. Uh, certainly right now we wanna talk about multiple lines of defense and the fact that there are a number of systems that play naturally and help improve the resiliency. So we have the natural um, coral reefs at the Atlantic Ocean, and those could be um, supplemented with uh, man-made reefs, or we could eventually evaluate uh, storm surge barriers, not included in this study, but maybe in future studies, looking at strategically located storm surge barriers. You have uh, the beach um, along the coast that could be reinforced with uh, maybe some uh, flood wall or some type of uh, structure that helps um, provide resiliency when that when that dune is eroded from storms. And then certainly the natural systems and systems that can be um, constructed to uh, mimic natural systems. And then certainly uh, going towards the, the West, we're looking at uh, adaptive measures, maybe uh, living shorelines and elevating structures. So all of these play together to improve the resiliency within Miami-Dade County. Next slide. So adaptive management, right now we're looking at what can we implement now and what can we implement in the future and trying to take advantage of the opportunities through our legislative process. Certainly right now we're targeting a chief support in 2024 to be um, expected to be included in the Water Resources Development Act of 2024. And then as we are finalizing that report, we are working and scoping on our next report, either in 2026 and or 2028. And certainly as each of these are moving forward into future phases, um, they'll be overlapping in terms of design and construction. And each of these opportunities will provide us to increase our understanding of the area and um, uh, influence future decisions based on what we're learning from current designs. Next slide. So it's been said many times that I think Miami-Dade County has the largest number of studies, uh, core studies in the area, but even more so than that, certainly there are a number of local initiatives and great work going on at the local level. And all of this combined uh, provides an opportunity to integrate and provide increased resiliency. So as we start at the Atlantic Ocean, certainly we have the beach uh, the beach project as well. And then there's the Key Biscayne project or study that's underway. And then certainly moving through to the back bay and including that um, data and understanding and measures that will that can be recommended. And then all the way to uh, moving west, including the 216 study and certainly um, Biscayne Bay, uh, BBC and all of the great infrastructure that can be implemented through those programs. And again, at the local level, there's so much that needs to be done here that certainly it's more than one agency or one locality can do on their own. And so the combination of all these together, if we're able to share information uh, between uh, different um, 
stakeholders, then certainly we can make these more complementary to improve the resiliency within Miami-Dade County. So looking at the measures that are included in our tentatively selected plan, which we expect to become the recommended plan in our final report, our recommended measures include, include 27 critical facilities, and that would include dry flood proofing, such as panels at doors, maybe some impermeable barriers around the, around the buildings, uh, elevation of HVAC units or backup and or backup generators, elevating them so they would not be at risk. And then for non-structural uh, focus areas, uh, approximately 2,100 residential buildings, and this would include single family buildings and four unit multifamily buildings, and then approximately 400 non-residential buildings. So dry flood proofing, similar to critical infrastructure, where you would have uh, some sort of panel and impermeable barrier. Um, uh, surrounding those buildings. And so the next process for this is we're looking at the tentatively selected plan uh, that would need to be, again, authorized in WERDA. And then funds would be appropriated by Congress and then uh, design agreement would be signed. Now the Jacksonville district will be working very closely, will work very closely with Jacksonville district, but they will work very closely with Miami-Dade County to uh, execute the the pre-construction engineering design phase, and then the construction phase uh, following that. In the Tenley Selected Plan, we have focused on uh, six focus areas, and these are subsets of the original seven focus areas that were included in the original study. We have a number of structures in each of those areas that are included, including one in Ventura. The next slides will show um, more detailed maps of the different areas, certainly Biscayne Canal, Little River, and Miami River. I did want to highlight the note at the bottom that not all the buildings that are identified or shown in the focus area will be included um, or will be eligible or feasible for elevation or flood proofing. Some additional analysis will be necessary. And I wanted to also stress that this is a voluntary program, so not um, all owners will uh, may want to participate in the program. And then, of course, we have North Beach and South Beach and Cutler Bay. I did want on the next slide, I did want to cover uh, two programs that we are requesting for authorization. The non-structural program will highlight will focus on structures that are more complex than say single family structures or uh, commercial properties. They will <clears throat> allow us to further investigate and implement non-structural measures for those types of structures such as um, hospitals or larger multifamily structures that may be more complicated um, to assess and uh, develop non-structural measures for. I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, try not to, to cough. Um, in addition, we also have a nature-based solution pilot program. The focus of the pilot program is to develop a suite of demonstration projects that will allow us to um, evaluate projects, uh, design and implement projects and monitor those projects for um, uh, for how they, uh, to assess how they function. And this will help us inform future decisions for nature-based solutions. Uh, types of nature-based solutions that can be considered, uh, maybe hybrid coral reef structure, structures, dune reinforcement, living shorelines. <clears throat> the idea is to locate these um, these features where damage is occurring, and we can monitor how those measures uh, reduce the damage to those to those areas. Uh, we will develop site specific projects and we'll have to do certainly additional analysis once those uh, locations are identified, and then we'll have to do additional um, environmental compliance on those uh, projects and again monitoring after those projects are complete.
So really want to take this time to say thank you for your input. Your input has uh, provided, has really formed the foundation on which this study has evolved. Certainly <clears throat> from that initial a year where we were prior to the go, no go, we developed <clears throat> in participation with you, the, the multi lines of defense, uh, certainly focusing on comprehensive benefits. This draft report is really focused on comprehensive benefits, on looking at environmental justice and focusing in on those that are most vulnerable in those areas where flooding occurs more frequently. Again, focusing on environmental justice and the in integration of studies and projects within the area. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, so I know that's, it's really just scratching the surface of uh, really the incredible amount of work that the Army Corps, the county, and and with feedback from from you all over the last, you know, six to eight months and several years has gotten us to this point. I did want to highlight from uh, Miami-Dade County side, um, we have launched a, a new section of our website. Um, so on our Sea Level Rise Strategy Hub, um, which is kind of our framework for dealing with all things, you know, flood risk and sea level rise adaptation. Um, we have a section on that site um, now called regional projects. Um, and Martina Potlich in our um, Office of Resilience uh, was critical in helping get this um, website pulled together along with our communications team and other folks. But in that regional projects uh, section on the website, which you can visit using the QR code here, You'll see both links to um, this study, the back base study um, led um, by the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as links to a handful of those other studies by the Army Corps of Engineers that were mentioned, but also the really important initiatives happening at the regional level, um, whether by the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, the partnership of, of the four counties here in Southeast Florida, from Palm Beach to Broward, uh, Miami-Dade and, and Monroe, um, as well as the South Florida Water Management District, um, you know, critical to our primary canal systems um, and really the main way uh, we help manage stormwater throughout our community, which is inherently connected uh, through the waterways and the bay and the coast um, to, you know, the ocean and where our storm surge risk comes from. So you can learn all about um, the other initiatives that um, Michelle was describing. Um, we aim to help integrate um, so that we're putting all the puzzle pieces together uh, here in Miami to build resilience across all our systems and taking advantage of every opportunity that might come along uh, through, through funding, through grants, uh, and to make sure that your voice is, is central to how those decisions and projects get formulated. So um, there's a separate site just for the back base study um, as well. And from there, you can link to the Army Corps site, which is where the draft report itself is available. Um, and you can, and that's also where you'll learn uh, how to submit comments. But um, we have that summarized here on this final slide. Um, I don't know if Michelle, you wanna just briefly share how folks can submit comments. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Christian. Uh, there is a website or there is an email uh, located on this slide, and we can maybe put that in the chat. Uh, you can send your email directly, your comments directly to that email. You can also go through the uh, public crowdsource, and I believe that I'm sorry, I can't see it on there, but uh, if you scan the QR code on the screen with your phone. I believe that'll take also take you directly to the website and that will be an opportunity, I believe, to share your comments. So your comments, uh, your formal, com formal comments for us to address would need to go through the email or through the crowdsource or through standard email to uh, care of Justine Woodward. And that formal comment period ends on May 23rd. So please feel free we welcome those comments. We look forward to those comments. I really appreciate all of the input we've received so far and look forward to your comments on this uh, draft report. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, wanted to call on um, Jim. Um, I think, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or, or turn it over to, to Rock, one of our other senior advisors on this project. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Christian and Michelle. Thank you for once again, taking us through the, uh, you, 
I think you must have this memorized. Uh, you've done. Thank you, and to your whole team for the various presentations we're making. Uh, we're really fortunate in our community to have available to us uh, a retired senior member of the Corps, uh, retired Colonel Rock Salt. He, he was commander at the district in Jacksonville. He's held positions on Everglades restoration uh, in the work in the office of the assistant secretary under a former administration. I, I just think Rock has a, a perspective that I find uh, important, sort of the understanding how the Corps has to package these things the way they do. But really, this is a, uh, a, a, a turning point for how the Corps is working with a lot of issues, not only in Miami-Dade, but around the country. So, Rock, could you give us a, a few words? Boy, thanks, Jim. Um, you're right. Uh, as, as we were working on this, it felt a lot like it did back when we started working on the Everglades restoration. We had more unknowns than we had knowns. We had a lot of uh, computer projections, uh, models, uh, and uh, uh, and we just started and built built it as best we could, conceptualized it as best we could, and then did it piece at a time. And that's exactly what the core is proposing here. Uh, in section two of the report is the conceptual framework. That's the big picture. And then what you're, what we're seeing today is first the, the pieces that uh, it can get done now to provide immediate protections uh, for the county. As the mayor said, uh, the hurricanes are, we're, we're just waiting for the a, uh, either a, a small, medium or large hurricane to come. And so tick tock, uh, as pointed out, there are two programs, uh, not the same, but similar ideas that there's more that the, the core and the county need to learn as we move forward on this. The final thing I'll say is uh, in the in the Everglades, the purpose was restoration. And so everyone understood that what what we had to do is come up with a uh, a way to score and evaluate different alternatives. This is a storm surge. And in the core's world, these kind of projects are normally uh, formulated to, to optimize, maximize the net economic benefits. This one is not. This one is the first project that I'm aware of that just formally, distinctly responds to the policy memorandum that says that you can put together a plan that optimizes the public benefits, which in our case here in Miami-Dade County include environmental justice, nature-based solutions, uh, along with the economic uh, factors. And so this, this particular set of recommendations, this particular plan for the conceptual framework represents that this new policy framework for the core. I would say to their great credit, <laughs> uh, the, the core put this out and we're trying to work it through, but they don't have the, the same level of guidance or protocols or models to be able to do this. And so we're looking forward to be a model for the country in terms of the nature-based pilot program and for the non-structural program that uh, Michelle briefed. So I think this is, this is really a, uh, this is new. This is kind of uh, uh, ice breaking kinds of uh, kinds of ideas. Um, it's certainly my honor to be with it, with Norfolk, with core headquarters, with the secretary's office, with the county in particular, as we try to put together a plan that we can move forward with in the decades ahead. I'm just, it's, uh, as an old guy uh, who's, who's been doing this, I just, uh, just really am proud to be part of it and proud of the county and the core for being able to put the package together. And I, my final thing is that what the county and the core did was take the, the fruits of the charrettes our county folks got together and said, why can't you do this? And, and the, the core and the county went through and tried to find a way to, to frame that out as, as best we could in the, in the time allotted. But it's there. Anybody who attended the charrettes, I hope you can see the fruits of your work here uh, because that's the, that's the concept that the, uh, the, that the county and the, and the core are proceeding. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Rock. Really appreciate your your support and perspective um, throughout this whole process. Um, so yeah, we've we've come to the point where uh, we really want to hear from you all, and I know we've gotten a, a few questions and comments in in the chat. Um, please, if if you have any other questions, go ahead and and put those in the chat, um, and we're going to go ahead and start addressing those one by one. Um, so to to start um, this. Uh, could be for Jim or Michelle. Um, Barbara was asking about, um, she, I think she asked, what about multi-story residential buildings? Um, maybe Michelle, you could speak a little bit to how the plan is, is looking at that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think as we're thinking about maybe the traditional multi-story residential buildings, uh, such as maybe the one or two-story buildings that I would imagine would be included in the, would be considered within those focus areas. However, anything larger than that, I think that might be something that we would investigate maybe in either future studies or maybe looking at during the uh, during that non-structural program where we can look at measures of um, larger buildings that may be more complex than just maybe elevating a structure. So something that's larger with maybe more than two stories may require a different measure than if we were just elevating a single family home. Thanks, Michelle. Um, another question from, from Barbara was, um, what focus area includes the Venetian Causeway? Um, well, let me, I can see Barbara there and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, Barbara's ongoing involvement as one of the leaders of the homeowner associations on, along the Venetian Causeway, which is one of our critical connections between the mainland Miami Beach. And I think the uh, at, at the current uh, first steps, Barbara, we'll be looking at these six areas. Uh, they represent some key um, positioning of the overall county's landscape, if you will, that will allow us to learn from those first applications. The causeways are present a, a unique um, set of circumstances. And I say it plural because as you know, we have about six of them. Uh, a number of them have islands that have residential connections. So we have, um, the county has determined that in, in addition to working on the uh, elements that you've heard talked about today, we are gonna be working with all of the entities that have responsibility for the causeways. That goes from this, the Florida Department of Transportation, the county, uh, and uh, and one of them run by a special district. We're going I think the causeways is something that will be one of those additional uh, studies, Barbara, uh, that we have to integrate into the larger picture. And as we move through, we we may be able to get deeper into it based on that work. So that's a long answer, but uh, it's a recognition of how special the causeways are, and uh, we couldn't fit them in as a focus area here. So we started working on something we think will uh, bring some attention that they deserve. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Um, so next question is from um, from Doug Yoder. Um, he's asking um, to what extent, if any, um, uh, does downstream pumping capacity on the regional canal system being increased to rapidly move water out of storm surge zones so that areas further west that depend on the drainage capacity to the east receive drainage relief sooner. Um, just sort of describing the, if there's not sufficient sizing and capacity in the canal system, how that affects discharge uh, points at the bay. So Christian, I would say that certainly will, as the 216 study was, I'm assuming would may evaluate this. Uh, well, one, um, anything coming from the 216 study will continue to uh, coordinate with that study to see uh, what recommendations they provide in the future and how certainly that would affect the, the back bay. And then certainly anything within the South Florida Water Management District, I would imagine that that collaboration will continue. And so however the canals are managed, 
I imagine that's specifically in an event uh, that coordination would uh, occur prior to the event to make sure that that flooding is not exacerbated, but I would defer to uh, you and Jim. Yeah, I think that slide, one of those three pillars, the third one is integration. And I personally think that's has the potential to be leveraged and, and um, you know, make sure that investments uh, are uh, not counterproductive for sure, but certainly lean on each other. So the timetable for some of the work on the large canals uh, are uh, driven by two things. A study uh, that the Florida, South Florida Water Management District and Jacksonville Core District are doing on the structures. You know, every one of uh, you may have driven by one of the big large canals that are, uh, they have these saltwater control structures. And uh, they are uh, all over 50 years old and in need of rehabilitation. And we have secured, uh, South Florida Water Management District has secured funding for C7, 8, and 9. That's a little river, Biscayne, and what's the far, one the far north? Uh, we're going to we're going to be sort of the same spirit. We we had the ability to get some funding. Let's get in and get to work on those structures. They won't be the final uh, investments. That'll come later. Uh, but that's how we're going to work. We're going to work with the different projects that may have a different combination of of sponsors. And when the actual project is ready for design and construction, we're going to have this integration take place. Big, big challenge, uh, but we're getting out of the silos to try to do it. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, so Truly Burton had a question. Um, she said, given housing affordability is a long-term issue for our community, how would an existing building be elevated and would there be any federal or other funds to help defray the cost for doing so? Um, FEMA insurance reductions connected to elevated buildings either new or existing buildings? So Christian, I can start with that. Uh, so in the Tenley Selected Plan, there are recommended measures to elevate buildings. Now this is a voluntary program. So the, the owner of that building would elect to participate and then we would have to evaluate if that building is eligible based on um, the structure, the soundness of the structure and the type of structure that it is. And in this case, for single family uh, residences, uh, depending on the type of structure, uh, what usually happens is that uh, structure is elevated uh, using jacks and a foundation and, and is uh, raised and then placed on a, a, a higher foundation. Now, there are certain, uh, certainly the the project would pay for the elevation of that structure, but your question is a, is a great question. I'm glad you asked it. There are additional costs that may come out of elevating a structure, uh, such as if there is moisture damage or termite damage, that is something that the project would not pay for. And that may be something that would be, or that is something that would be a cost to the owner of that building. And so that is something to consider. And certainly as we close in on, um, an implementation plan and uh, work, the Corps and Miami-Dade County work together on an implementation plan, there'll be some education and some information out to the public so that those who would like to participate in those programs would be aware of uh, the roles and responsibilities and the different um, information that's necessary to participate, and then also what may um, be required in terms of cost moving through that, uh, moving through that program. Jim, I saw you came off mute. Did you want to add? Yeah, I think this is a we're this is certainly an area where it deserved the the attention of of two specific pieces of the of the draft plan. The six focus areas came about by uh, walking the actual streets, but also we knew they already had uh, compound flooding issues. Now, not just storm surge issue from a hurricane, but they flooded heavy rains and high tides and otherwise. And they contained a unique representation of the um, what, what the housing people call naturally occurring affordable housing, NOAA. You know, the backbone of the affordable housing in our county is not the new stuff. It's the old buildings that 
originally were built as, as we came. And you all know what happens in our community. As we grow, we gentrify. And those buildings get torn down, right? And they don't get replaced with new affordable housing. So what this program, if you think about it, actually gives us an opportunity to keep the existing structures, a limited, the, the Michelle has talked about the size limitation, and evaluate with a willing owner, can we keep your structure intact, raise it, and pr provide you that additional protection? Now, then the core's cost share on that would be 65% federal for those things they can pay for, and 35% local, which we will be have to determine what's the mix of funds that go into that. I think the other thing the county has to do is look, when we get to that point, is say, if we've got a neighborhood that's already uh, in this position, you know, what kind of other public improvements have to be made and timed to the disturbance, uh, the disruption, excuse me, because people will have to move out of their houses. If we're really good, maybe we can coordinate a uh, the extension of the sewer line, not only down the street, but to the house uh, and get them off of septics. Because some of those um, focus areas have homes under septics that are still served by septics. And uh, there may be other things that come from other funding sources besides the core program that will leave that homeowner uh, in a better place and being able to maintain the equity in the home uh, and pay off uh, whatever perhaps the uh, contribution they made to the to the 35. So that's in my mind what what will have to happen when we get down to the curb level and we're looking and talking to individual owners. Thanks, Michelle and Jim. Um, I'll add real quick, you know, the other really kind of benefit of, of looking at elevating homes is that um, you know, whether it's elevating, you know, two or three feet or or more, depending on, you know, how low or how vulnerable a particular area is, um, it reduces risk not only to storm surge flooding, but also to, you know, rainfall flooding or or even, you know, what we might call compound flooding, a mix of, of tidal flooding and rainfall flooding. So by elevating up high, this is really a way that we're implementing our, you know, one approach in the county sea level rise strategy. You know, we call it building like the keys because we see a lot of that type of elevated uh, elevated homes there. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean homes <laughs> jacked up on uh, 10 feet off the ground on piles. It, it could be uh, much subtler than that and still provide uh, significant protection. Um, so I want to uh, do one more question and then I'll turn it over to Martina to, to um, share in other questions. So uh, John Alman asked, um, I think it was actually uh, partly answered in the chat. What is included in the North Beach focus area that was mentioned on the slide? And I think Abby helped cover that um, in the chat about it including non-structural measures, which includes a mix of home elevations and flood proofing of non-residential structures. Um, and in that in that North Beach area, um, there's about eight critical infrastructure assets that would be um investigated further for uh, potential flood proofing or protection. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, John. And then um, Martina, I'll turn it over to you to, to ask the next questions. Thanks. We have a question from Ada Curtis about uh, what is the timing of the nature-based pilot projects? Um, I think uh, Abby started answering it in the chat as well. Um, did you want to add anything, Abby? Hey, Martina, uh, don't want to add anything unless uh, Michelle or others have thoughts to add. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we have that the timing of the MBS pilot projects is dependent on the program being first authorized by Congress, then uh, federal funding is appropriated, and then a design agreement between UCs and Miami-Dade County uh, completed. So it is hard to say exactly. Uh, we will provide updates to those items as we get them. And the program begins uh, in the future. As the program begins in the future, there will be multiple public and stakeholder engagements to influence the formulation of those MBS projects. Martina, I saw, um, I think Aida asked just a quick follow-up about, uh, I think she said two years, question mark. So I don't yeah. know. Uh, Michelle or, or others, if you want to. 
provide any clarification. Yeah, no, I appreciate that uh, timeline. As Abby mentioned, it's, it's difficult to predict. Certainly the authorization of the program is what is key and then um, what, and then also appropriation or the funding of that program. But even in between that, uh, there may be development of implementation guidance. These are new programs that we are requesting for authorization. So there will be some coordination on how they would be um, implemented and what would be required for each of the, the pieces of those programs. So probably part of that coordination would need to occur uh, prior uh, or in coordination with uh, funding of that. And so it unfortunately is difficult to say, but our first opportunity uh, maybe say um, if it's authorized in 24, uh, you, you know, it could maybe later than maybe 25 or 26 where you could see funding, but it really depends on um, when those could be, uh, when those could be funding could be provided and, uh, and, the implementation guidance provided. So I, I know that's not a direct answer. I do apologize for that, but really dependent on um, the funding that we're able to get. Rock? I, what, but everything Michelle said is right. Uh, no, none of us can do anything until Congress authorizes the program and Congress provides the funding. Uh, everything Michelle said on that, the uncertainty with that or exactly it. The only thing I wanted to add is this is one of the highest priorities uh, for the county. When, when, when the original study was, was interrupted, the, the prime reason the county said we would like to see a, a, an approach that's got more nature-based, a more nature-based approach. And so now we have the opportunity and the core equally is interested in developing the information and the data that allows the core nationwide to to apply these kinds of measures, uh, nature-based measures to core projects nationwide. So I what Michelle said is right. I, I'm I'm just hopeful that the the priority within the core and within the county will will make that uh, happen as quick as those things can be done. But it, it it's not going to happen uh, real quick. Hey, Christian, I I want to add another perspective, and I I want to state by saying, in a very respectful way, what we're doing with the core is not the only action in town. Um, we have uh, available to us now. We didn't the first time we got into this, the Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board, which is a cross section of our community with leaders, uh, they're constantly exploring uh, nature-based systems, living shorelines. You know, we have sometimes language that's talking about the same thing. The county has active uh, applications pending with other federal agencies to do nature-based system work in South County. Some of those may uh, accelerate faster based on funding. All of them in the end have to get permitted. And every time we execute from design to construction, uh, nobody's exempt from the permitting. And we, ha we will have to figure out a pathway forward for all of these projects that are going to find that sweet spot between what we do and need to do to protect our bay and, and where we can entertain and execute these kinds of solutions. I don't know what it is, but I know that, that we're, nobody's going to be exempt. So we're going to, if the project starts because a NOAA funded thing got started first, we'll have that learning to, to apply when we're ready to go here. Thanks. We have another question in the chat uh, from Senan Garcia. Has a study been done to see how much sand is accumulating on the coral reefs to ensure any outplanting will not be in vain? I'm not sure, uh, Martina, and, and the question uh, that we had the right folks on the call. Um, our experts from the county are uh, in the Division of Environmental Resource Management and the core Jacksonville team uh, that does the beach work. Um, I know they are very, very uh, sensitive to that. We have one of the best uh, managed beaches in the world, and it's uh, you can go out and see it. <laughs> and that's 
where we uh, think that we'll learn a lot. So uh, in terms of the sand disturbance out on the reef, I don't know that maybe someone else on one of the core teams or our team feels comfortable answering. If not, we should get back to that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll share just a little bit, uh, Jim. I do think you're right. Um, we have other experts who who could answer this in more detail, but um, I do know that you know uh, the folks who, um, like at University of Miami and others who deployed, you know, sort of hybrid reef structures, um, you know, they they take great care to make sure and to monitor, um, you know, the existing coral reefs and, and others to see how, if any, impacts there might be from that, that nourishment. So um, I don't have the, the uh, statistics or, or, or study bullet points to, to highlight right now, but um, we can definitely follow up and share that information uh, with you, Senna. Thanks for that question. Uh, we had a next question uh, from John Wall, which uh, was answered by Abby, but the question is, um, who will have approval authority to move forward with any recommended projects? Um, he's aware of the study being active for six years or so. According to a slide in this presentation, completion of any projects from the study is at least six years away. Um, and Abby answered that the tent tentatively selective plan, uh, which includes non-structural measures and critical infrastructure is anticipated to begin the pre-construction engineering and design phase potentially within one to two years, um, leading construction to start potentially in four to five years. And at the same time, further study efforts will continue for analysis of additional measures. The advantage of this Word of 24 report is that those recommendations can get the lengthy, lengthy authorization, appropriations, pre-construction design process started sooner than if those recommendations were part of the next authorization opportunities in Word of 26 and 28. Um, I hope that clarifies the answer a bit. And Martina, if I, if I could add something, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, so originally when we were uh, doing this additional time and money, we were talking about one report in 2027. And so the guidance from headquarters said, you know, we understand the complexity of the area, but we really do want to implement something more quickly. And so that's how that initial proposal we provided for additional time and money was uh, modified to implement, you know, to focus on the opportunities through the WERDAs and evaluate and implement something more quickly. So it, I under, I definitely understand the time frame and, and looking at that, but if we were to go with the original proposal, uh, it would have, you know, we would have proposed it in 27 and then we would not have, uh, it would not have been authorized till 28. And then it's, it would have been after that before we would have gotten into design and into that PED phase and then into construction. So this does uh, start the wheel or uh, start the train more quickly uh, so that we can implement something more quickly. If, if I could just on this, again, I'll say the same thing I said before, both Abby and Michelle are saying what, you know, we can't do anything until Congress provides funds. I mean, that, that's, the, that's, a, that's just the law. Uh, once the core has authority to start pre-ped, uh, pre-engineering and design, which I hope will be this fall, that means uh, I also believe that both the Secretary Connor and the mayor want to get this moving. I think there are relatively straightforward op opportunities on the protection of critical infrastructure they don't, you never know till you know, but it seems to me that it's possible that we would start to see some protections for our critical infrastructures sooner than the timelines that Abby and Michelle are required to, to promise. Uh, but I just, I'm just saying that what I, I'm saying, I'm not official. I'm saying I would, I would bet that we're going to see design on this starting by the end of the year, the pre-engineering and design starting by the end of the year. And depending on the nature of 
you know, the, the nature of design people on this call would know as, as well as me as to how long uh, from, from the start of the, the design process till actually plans and specs to see work on the ground. That, that, that kind of depends on what we're talking about, but I, I'm trying to convey, I think the sense of both the assistant secretary, the Corps of Engineers and the mayor that TikTok you know we 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 need to we need to uh, we need we need to do this as uh, expeditiously as promptly as we can it's a complicated problem let's start with the easy things and get them going while we work longer on the harder things so i mean i, I didn't want to lose that sense of a proportion on this thanks Thanks, Rock. I think we'll go to our next question from Catherine Hagman. Um, are the only critical facilities that are eligible for hardening um, in focus areas, other critical facilities outside the focus areas like the WWTPs not included? Also with the non-structural program, could additional multifamily properties become eligible or are only for properties authorized for flood protection? Um, and Faraz did provide an answer in the chat. Um, some of uh, the critical facilities were outside of the focus areas. If we thought they could provide support to the focus area, uh, we did analyze this, the central WWTP, but it had high ground elevation to where we were seeing no direct economic um, or damage or risk. That along with other WWTPs, can be looked at further in the future effort or even as part of the non-structural program. And the non-structural program was meant to look at multifamily with four units or greater since that's where we have limited information. But if there happens to be unique ones that are four units or less, then we can take a look as well. We have some flexibility. Does anybody want to add to that? I would really be remiss if I we didn't welcome from the far west coast of the United States our former partner and team member, Katie. Thank you for joining. It so happened that representatives of Marin County, California stopped by to see staff today. We chatted about our mutual uh, issues and challenges. So a lot happens uh, between um, uh, different peers that are working on this. There's Katie. Hi. Say hello, Katie. Hello, good to see you guys. <laughs> Great progress, uh, very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining. Also, WWTPs are waste water treatment plants. And the, I, I just would add to uh, what had been responded to Katie's question. The time frame squished down meant that we had to select the easy ones that we could move on very quickly with the data and uh, information that the core needed to do the models. But I think we've selected, um, in most part, uh, the types of critical projects that whatever we learned from this first batch, we could easily transfer from a fire station that was on the list to a fire station that was not. Uh, we have our work to do on the waste uh, water treatment plants, and I know Christian is working on that uh, with our counterparts at WASD. But I think the uh, the idea of having to prioritize a lot had to do with what are the types of critical facilities that needed to be protected, but also needed to come back online as quickly as possible to help in a recovery if we actually experienced a storm surge wave. Thanks. All right. I think um, it's another question from from Truly Burton. Um, they ask any interest in coastal cities moving forward on examples like planting mangroves along the shorelines, um, Aventura, for example. Um, and they made the comment about mangroves growing very slowly um, and how that I think that level of protection can take time to to grow. So, kind of a general question about. Uh, planting mangroves along the shoreline, 
efforts relate to Aventura? Well, I would, it's a good question and truly is, you know, experience of working with our cities and it's important, you know, for the county, the state here, obviously that there's, we will not force any municipal activity if it's a, a project owned by a city, we'll, we'll only go forward if they agree, just like we stated earlier about a private property owner. But more than that, we need their partnership. They know their, uh, their, their turf better than we do. And we have cities that have uh, gone forward and experimented with a variety of things. Um, in, uh, I know that a city of uh, Miami Beach has looked at even at uh, uh, lifting homes uh, in their unique scenario out there. So you North Miami Beach has looked at, um, you know, turning uh, certain areas into stormwater uh, holding areas. So this isn't going, the creativity that we are hope to take advantage of is going to come not only from this project, but from a host of other things that our municipal partners are engaged in. And that's an avid level of sharing that we're going to encourage. Yeah, and Jim, I'll just add to that. Um, when you think about like, you know, uh, mangroves, I think that also kind of intersects with a conversation a lot of folks have about what we call living shorelines and how do we, you know, think beyond just just seawalls. Um, so the county, led by our uh, Division of Environmental Resources Management, um, is actually working on uh, a living shorelines guidance document, which will really, you know, allow, it's kind of, you know, uh, separate from this Army Corps study, but, you know, definitely will be helpful in informing all, all agencies and stakeholders on, you know, what are the, the different scenarios, you know, what are the different types of living shorelines out there, and, and how can we design those in places where they're most suitable um, to reduce, you know, uh, erosion, provide more protection, and in many cases, you know, extend the life of the of the gray infrastructure, the seawalls. Um, so I know there's some great examples um, out of City of Miami Beach, like the Brittany Bay Park project um, and others that, uh, you know, we expect to see more of those popping up and, you know, through the nature-based pilot program of this study, um, you know, get uh, get experience working with the Army Corps of Engineers in, in doing this in, in areas that will provide storm surge uh, risk reduction benefits. And, you know, once we, once we're able to pilot and test some of those things through this program, um, you know, we're really hoping that opens up opportunities and, and help us potentially scale things up, you know, through the Army Corps, in addition to, you know, taking advantage of other opportunities through other funding uh, means. So thanks for that question, truly. Um, the next question is from, from Barbara Bisno. Um, who in the county is focusing and coordinating the causeways issues regarding climate change? You want to take that? Take that one, Jim. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I remember again, I, you know, I think our office is underscoring the word coordinate. Um, again, as we, as I spoke earlier, the causeways are each unique um, and have a history, and they are, in some cases, uh, owned by different public entities. And, and they are vital uh, to our um, transportation network on a day-to-day -day basis and to our evacuation network. That's why, as I said, we are um, cognizant of the fact that they're kind of a special case. And we're going to, uh, at, we've already had the, uh, uh, you know, Florida Department of Transportation, uh, their local office is called District 6. They reached out to us and said, we want to look at this issue with you, uh, not just on a specific causeway, but generally speaking, uh, how, how do we learn about uh, how to handle these? We have specific things already underway. Uh, as you know, on Venetian, uh, uh, Rickenbacker, um, the, the, there are studies going on on the um, uh, on Tuttle. So our job is to make sure that as we do these incrementally, we, we're, we're all gaining uh, a better understanding. There are immense water quality issues that, that are at stake here that were never uh, part of the initial thinking on those causeways. 
And so we have owe it to our bay that as we make these structural improvements, often for just for transportation, that we're looking at uh, not certainly not doing no harm to the bay, but perhaps improving uh, circulation and water quality. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I think we had a, a few other comments. Um, Aida Curtis saying we that uh, definitely want more collaboration and, and permitting countywide for these solutions. Um, truly, Burton was adding another comment about another idea is to permit clean construction demolition fill to be used as part of a living shoreline and long seawalls to be able to reuse that. Um, and uh, John Wall adding a comment. Uh, thanking, thanking Jim for his answer about the timing and saying, I fully understand the time frame issues when dealing with the Army Corps, et cetera. Uh, his concern is that these options may be rejected by individual localities or interest groups and the funding opportunity and potential progress will be lost. Um, definitely hear you on that, on that, John. There'll be a really a, a continuing and expanded effort to, to educate and engage, you know, the public um, as, and as of course, our municipalities being key partners, um, as, the, as that's where a lot of the, the focus areas are are intended. And it's, um, again, to stress, it is a voluntary program. So we're going to be looking to, um, you know, and analyze and, and, and prioritize those where it makes the most sense based on what folks are interested in and, you know, uh, being able to, to really show how we're reducing risk through these proposed projects. So um, waiting to see if there's any other questions in the chat. Um, I think Robert just added a, another comment about mangroves. Thanks for thanks for adding that, Robert. Um, I think that might be all the questions for now. So I'll make just at least one more call to see if, if anyone has any other questions or um, if anyone from, from the Army Corps or county teams want to to add anything at this point, um, just give folks another another couple moments to add questions they might have. Um, I think we'll, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. And you can see how to comment on the draft report there in the chat. So again, the formal comments are due by May 23rd. You can submit those through uh, an email directly to the Army Corps of Engineers or through their online um, uh, crowdsource reporter tool. That's where you can actually open up a map of the different focus areas and, and drop a pin and, and add a comment, um, you know, speaking to what's in the report. Um, I'll mention on the, on the website, um, you can also find uh, copies of the poster boards that were shared at the public meeting last week. Um, we might find some additional detail. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll just open it up to see if there's any other comments or our last questions. Christian, I, I just want to uh, make sure everyone knows that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a Health of the Bay conference. Maybe, uh, Martina, uh, could you put that information in, in the, uh, that, that happens about every two years, sponsored by a, a, co a coalition of advocates on behalf of the Bay. and. Uh, there's a lot of the issues we talked about uh, are going to be aired there. And to reiterate that uh, there are quarterly meetings of the Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board, and which is county uh, generated, and, uh, and the Biscayne Bay Commission, which is state. Uh, and so, again, we, we have the places to have this discussion on an ongoing basis. Uh, and we could do Zoom calls uh, like this also. But it's so important uh, that we hear from everybody. Uh, we just can miss the key question unless you're willing to raise it and then per be persistent till we get you your answer, like Barbara Vizno does. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Uh, so I'm I'm great. This is this is a wonderful opportunity to share. And uh, I, I, to, to Rock or to our core team, anything? Hey, Jim, I just... Right now, the the I'll call it the bureaucracy. I mean that in a good sense. The players uh, 
both in Norfolk, uh, in the core headquarters in the county. They have a lot of work to do to get this this draft report finalized, get it go through the hoops to check, well, getting to the chief of engineers or his report. So there's just a whole lot of important focus on getting this report uh, to the chief of engineers, getting his signature, and and getting it sent up to Congress. So it's been a little bit. Uh, we've been kind of chilling our jets that are saying, okay, while they do that, while Michelle and Abby and Jim and his team do all that, can, how can we start getting ready for the next phase? And what I what I hear a lot and what I think at every level I'm hearing that the process, once something is completed, once it's signed by the chief, once it's authorized by Congress, the expectation is there will be just an emphasis on sort of engaging the public on the on the not nature based pilots, uh, obviously with the communities when you start talking about the non structural uh, pieces of this, that I, I, I think there will be, I predict that there will be as as much opportunity for people to, to get engaged, we've got to prioritize this stuff. And the only way you can prioritize it and get everybody back together again and have a process where we prioritize, we prioritize. And I think I, every, I know the core from Michelle all the way up to the chief of engineers uh, is committed to that. I know the county is, I know the secretary's office is. So, I mean, I think, I think there will be, there will be, I am predicting that you you will get tired of the opportunity to come and participate in in these, uh, in these. this is a brand new thing. Corps has never done something like this before anywhere. And and the energy for this is coming from the Corps, uh, you know, from the Corps writ large, because they know they need, they need some, some examples on the ground. And so that's why, that's why it feels, so confident that the money will be there and because they the core wants this information this is not this is about miami-dade county but it's about something bigger from the core i believe so anyway that's i'll stop christian could i interrupt just a minute i see that lauren para our new uh sure. chief bay and water resources officer is on and, and i think in terms of the on going forward with a lot of this uh folks will see a lot more of lauren lauren you want to say hello Hey, Jim, thanks for that. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, you know, I don't have anything else to add. I think you and, and Rock and the core team and Christian have covered this so well, um, but certainly happy to be involved when it comes to engaging, like you said, the Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board or a state uh, Biscayne Bay Commission. You're right that there's lots of overlap between these two critical issues for our residents. Oh, uh, Michelle, your team. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. I, I think I would just like to say thank you. This has definitely been a long journey and we have learned a lot and really appreciate all of the input and the time invested in making this a, a you know, a great plan moving forward. So I just appreciate everybody's time and the commitment that they've provided to us uh, to make this a great plan. So Thank you for your time this evening and for your uh, time you've invested so far. Close us up, Christian. All righty. Well, thanks again, uh, Michelle, uh, Jim, the whole team, and, and everyone for joining tonight. Um, just as a reminder, these um, the presentation and um, recording of of this uh, webinar will be will be shared on uh, on the website. So. Um, the same link you use to view the draft report, you can look to see copies of that um, here in the in the coming days. So uh, please be sure to to spread the word and let folks know that the public comment period is is ending here in just a few weeks. And we really want your your input to to make sure this final draft report uh, that goes for signature can be can be the best version of it and it, it speaks to to your your needs and your your concerns and your um 
you know, your ultimate hopes for what, what this uh, study can do for our, our coastal resilience in Miami-Dade. So anyway, appreciate everyone's support. Um, we'll be talking to you soon and keep an eye and ear out for that. But uh, all right. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks.